And welcome to another edition of the Unreasonable Odds Podcast. I'm Steve Buchanan, solo. Oh yeah, Julian Edlow is gone. He's on paternity leave. He's probably cleaning up messes everywhere. He's going to be gone for a couple weeks here, so it's just going to be me here on the Unreasonable Odds Podcast. But it doesn't mean that the content is going to stop here. We're going to start off, as we always do, with Johnny Avello for Odds Are, talking about the massacre that was the public betting side for week six here in the NFL. Then after that, we're going to talk to one of my good friends here, Ryan Newton. He is the betting content manager at 4 for 4 and at 4 for 4 bets We're going to talk all about the week seven board. Maybe talk a little bit week eight, too, as well. He does a lot of look ahead lines uh, content for 4 for 4 as well. So we're going to get to all that here on this week's edition of the Unreal Squads podcast. But as we always do, let's kick it off with Johnny Avella. All right, and as always, we're going to get to one of our favorite segments here on the show. It is Odds Are with our guy, Johnny Avello, director of, uh, DraftKings Director of Race and Sportsbook Operations. Johnny, as always, looking good, sir. How are you? Uh, real well, Steve. Thank you. No problem. All right, let's talk about, let's get to some of these questions here from last week and looking into this week. Massive upset week in week six here. We had six games where the money line favorite was at least 200 or higher, and the underdogs end up going 4-2 and two last week. Can you remember a time when so many huge favorites were beaten outright on a given week? Uh, you know, Steve, I'm sure it's happened, but I don't remember when. But, you know, somebody that's got to do it old age, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's really been a very strange season up to this no point. Doubt. You know, the underdogs are covering at a – at an abnormal rate, the scoring is particularly low. Um, now we're, you know, the third of the season over with. And so, you know, what, will we be talking about this or will they be forgotten words by the end of the season? Right. Uh, or will we say what a year it was? I, I think uh, things will change. And then of those heavy favorites, that loss, which included the Buccaneers, Ravens, Packers and 49ers, which one of those games was the biggest win for the house last week? Uh, the Packers Jets drew a slightly bigger handle than the Steelers Bucks and the Ravens Giants, but the Bucks loss was the biggest revenue maker of the chalk implosions. Uh, strangely, the Niners game wasn't in our top 10 of the week. Wow. That spread closed around four. Uh, and I, that may have scared some betters off. So that one didn't come into play. And then we don't have to talk about all negativity for the public. There were some areas where the public did do well. Uh, which games last week were the most profitable for them? Well, that's going to be a very short list. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm trying to ensue some positivity here. <laughs> uh, Bengals and Vikings, both games yeah. open pick and close three. Bengals and Vikings, the public choices, but uh, that was that was the only positive sides that you know got there for the for the week. And then when you're kind of making these odds here, you know, we kind of hear about how you know books like to use like a power rankings, how they're ranking some team here, and they use that there. Is there any teams that have really kind of moved up or down in the ranks here? You know, obviously both New York teams have been done very well so far this season, so I feel like that could be a couple teams there. But are there any teams in particular that you have really seen kind of move up or down that list as the season has gone on? Yeah, you mentioned in, to two New York teams, actually the, not the not the Buffalo team, the Giants and Jets. Sure. Uh, those two New York teams, have, they're moving up, but they still haven't broken through the top 15 power ratings. Uh, the Eagles have been moving up the ladder all year. And they're in the top five now. And the Vikings are moving up, but they still have much to prove. Now, on the other side, who's going the opposite way? Packers are falling quickly. Sure. And the Cards and the Broncos are also on a big decline. Yeah, it'll be interesting, too, to see with the Cardinals. Obviously, two new receivers coming into the mix there. DeAndre Hopkins coming back. Robbie Anderson was just acquired from the Panthers during the week. So we'll kind of see how that shakes out for Arizona moving forward. But one last note here on Week 6. Uh, the general consensus, at least on social media, is that Week 6 was seen like a really tough board. We had a lot of close spreads or really big favorites like the Buccaneers and the Rams. There wasn't really a lot of in-between. When you have kind of tough weeks like this, for really for people to decide on which side to take on, do you think you see less action in those type of weeks, or is it still about the same? Because at the end of the day, the NFL is just a massive powerhouse no matter what they put out there. 
Yeah, on the big on the big favorite side, as long as the spreads are around ten and a half or under, the bigger chalk seem to write, you know, those seem to write a considerable amount of business. You start sure. getting up in those 13, 14, 17 areas, which we haven't seen yet this year, they seem to kind of drop off on the business side. Uh, all of the lines that are from two to seven that are perceived unknown winners, and therefore, you know, therefore they are creating excellent two-way action from both the sophisticated and the unsophisticated betters. Yep. And then let's talk about this week here. We got Thursday night football come uh, coming up here. Um, the under has been five in one in this so far in the games this season, and then we have two teams that, when you look at how they've been playing and you look at them overall. We could see another under here. The Saints continue to be ravaged by injuries. The Cardinals just can't seem to get out of their own way. Are under bets for these games in particular becoming a big liability for the book week in and week out? Oh, uh, to the contrary, Steve. Uh, you know, this trend has been outstanding for the house as most bets are over and will continue to do so. Uh, you know, who wants a bet under in a Bills Chief game or a Steelers Bucks game? Uh, and I realized that the, those these unders are running at a clip of about 60% this yeah. year, yep. which is crazy. But the betters are looking for an inversion in weeks to come. You know, the question is, will they get it? I, you know, I personally believe there'll be some form of normalization. Sure. So we'll see, uh, you know, but it, it, this is a trend for the first uh, six weeks. It's been amazing. Yeah, we'll see if that continues here. Like I mentioned, two teams that have just been really struggling so far to begin the year. Uh, let's just wrap this up here with a little uh, look into week seven here. Uh, which games have seen the big early money thus far? Yeah, Early money uh, as shown on the Titans at home versus the Colts. Uh, on the favorite side, um, that lines up from Titans one and a half up to two and a half at home. Uh Let's see, the Bucks again at the Panthers. Yeah. Spreads up to 11 from nine and a half. Uh, Chiefs getting a play at the 49ers. That lines up from one and a half to three. Now on the dog side, the Falcons opened up seven. That's down, now down to six at Cincinnati. And the Seahawks opened seven and a half at the Chargers. That's dropped a full point uh, down to six and a half. You know, th these the games are bet on what have you seen lately? And what we've seen lately is, uh, you know, a Falcon team that's hung around with teams and a Charger team that's kind of struggling at times to score. And, you know, that's that's why these lines move early. Now, when we get towards the end of the week, they may move the opposite direction. And then I'll wrap it up with this one here. You were at G2E last week. Um, what slot machine is going to be my new favorite that's coming out? <laughs> I don't know. Probably some kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, word of worlds or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Big slot player over here. I got to get out to G2E some year. I, the, obviously, the, uh, the the stuff they have is incredible. So that's kind of on my Vegas bucket list is to get out to G2E one year. It is a show that you should definitely go to if you haven't been to it. A lot of networking going on, but there there are a lot of new innovations out there to see. No doubt. All right. As always, DraftKings Director of Race and Sportsbook Operations, Johnny Avello, joining us here for Odds Are, sir. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, Steve. See you then. Talk to you then. Thanks. All right. So that does it there for Odds Are with Johnny Avello. Thanks for him coming on, as always. Now we're going to get to the meat of the podcast here. Again, without Julian Edlo. He's on paternity leave. You know, no, no rush to come back. You have, you, you have your hands full. So I figured if I need some heavy lifting to be done, i got to ask my guy, Ryan Noonan, to come on the show here this week here. If you're not familiar with Ryan, first of all, you should be. But he's a betting content manager at 444 and at 444 Bets. My man, it's been a while. How are you doing? It's good. It's a homecoming for me. You know, this is back in the – we used to do this together over here at the DraftKings streets, and I'm uh, proud of you to see uh, – you grow up and take on so much in this game. I'm just excited. I'm excited to be chatting with you. Always enjoy your stuff. Always enjoy your energy. And uh, yeah, good to see you. Appreciate it so much, man. Of course, go to 444.com if you want to look for any. They got some uh, amazing content there for seasonal DFS and betting. So if you're looking for a spot to land to get some information, 444.com, I would highly, highly recommend checking them out here. But let's get to this board here for week seven. Real quickly, before we get to week seven, 
I thought week six was one of the toughest boards that we've seen in a long time. I would say that week seven could potentially have been that one if it wasn't for last week, because now I feel like I, I can't complain every week. But I feel like this is also kind of a tough week as well. Yeah, man, I – so as far as, like, sides go, Steve, like, I just know that – even if I feel like I have a good lean, oftentimes I just know I'm probably getting in bad, right? This is like the right. most efficient market <laughs> in the world. So um, one of the actually free articles that I write over at 4 for 4 every week is a look ahead lines article. I actually just yeah. sent in week eight uh, about an hour ago. So because I do think that that's the edge, right? Is for us to kind of get ahead of any line movement. And it's almost like a parlay, right? So my mindset is if my week seven handicap is pretty strong, then I'm probably going to be able to beat the number and occasionally around key numbers for week eight. Right. And I felt that in a very strong way about two spots in week seven. I got the Bucks at six and a half uh, on the road in Pittsburgh because I thought for sure that the Bucks were going to get going. Steelers are just struggling. That's going to move two and through seven. And it closed at like 10. Doesn't yeah. matter. I no, love the spot for the Ravens. <laughs> I thought that the Ravens was a great matchup uh, for Lamar. And again, we know how that kind of you know, didn't get massive yep. CLV on that, but it did move to like six. You know, I got them at five and that can kind of be a key number ish nowadays with the way teams mess around with the two point conversion and it just doesn't matter. So uh, maybe this is a good week because I don't feel, I don't love anything on the board from a side standpoint, but Hey, yeah. there's a couple that I think are interesting for us to chat about. Yeah. We, we were just talking about with Johnny Avello too. There was uh, six teams that were a minus 200 uh, or, or better favorite and, Wild. They went two and four, which is amazing. Like I couldn't remember a time where so many heavy favorites were just flat out lost like this. Like it was, it was an incredible week. It was a bloodbath for the public. So hopefully we can regain something here. Um, first game I want to chat about, I want to talk about this Bengals and Falcons game. Now, normally this would not be a team or a game that I'd be focusing on, but the big narrative here is that the Falcons are the only undefeated team against the spread left in the NFL thus far, which is amazing to not only say, but to think about, because when you look at that offense as a whole, when you look at that defense, they feel pretty, you know, unimposing. That said, they're still perfect against the spread. Uh, we have a Bengals team that I think is really kind of uh, hasn't met expectations, obviously coming off the Super Bowl last year. We all love to talk about the hangover, but that core of the team is still here in 2022, but they just really haven't gotten it going here. Um and I think there's, we're putting into a little too much stock because a lot of people, I feel like, are, are back in the Falcons here. But a lot of it is coming off of, well, they, they were able to go up and down the field against the 49ers last week. The 49ers are just decimated by injuries right now, especially on defense. So do you think that that's maybe kind of changing the perception of how the Falcons are looked at going, you know, going in and playing well against the 49ers? and people thinking that they should continue here and at least cover what's at six and a half right now. What are your thoughts overall on this game? Because I want to back the Bengals here, but, you know, I'm probably going to be on the other side compared to the public at this rate. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. It is a weird spot for San Francisco last week, too. And you mentioned the injuries, right? They were decimated, you know, especially on the defensive side because they came in with a league-leading defense. Basically, in any metric that mattered, San Fran was at the top of the board or at least in the top three. And they had played the week prior in Carolina and they were smart and stayed on the East coast. But I also think like that kind of can wear on a team too. So, you know, it's like a double road game where yeah, the travel going back to the West coast and then back again for a game in the Southeast doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's like a right. business trip. And then sometimes I, I think that there's, I mean, these guys are also humans, right? We spend so much time. We're analyzing yeah. data and matchups and running models and doing all this stuff. And like there are real people playing this game. And that was probably just a weird wonky spot and i think that the falcons do play such a weird brand of football that probably made it very difficult right. to, uh, to game plan for like, mariota just was i think like 30th out of 35 in pass rate over expectation heading into that game um because i bet under on his attempts and his completions um and he yep. made me sweat on the completions because he just <laughs> right. he didn't miss uh, but we still right. we still hit the unders because he still they threw 15 times in the game which is insane. I'm with you on the Bengals. The Bengals, you know, we knew some of the bugaboos early in the season with not being able to really keep Joe Burrow upright, him having some difficulty with cover two. The Falcons kind of balance what they do from a cover one and cover two standpoint. They're 32nd in adjusted sack rate on the season. They're just not getting home. Um, they yeah. blitz at kind of like a middle of the league pace, but they're like 30th in success rate while blitzing. So like, that's not great either. They're not getting home when they're doing so. So 
I don't know, AJ Terrell is just not having the year that he was last year. It's really the only answer right. that they have defensively to even kind of slow these guys down. I don't know. I'm with you on the Bengals. I think getting anywhere under seven is probably the right side. Um, and, you know, they take a little steam. I think they're probably an interesting teaser like to think they take care of business here at yep. home. And I don't know, six and zero against the spread. All I hear Steve is they're due to lose, right? Like that's just not exactly, happen. exactly. Yeah. No, but people, but people will hear that and they go, Oh, well then they got, I got to continue on this trend. They're undefeated against the spread. And, it's just so rarely happens and it's not going to be sustainable. And then going up against a team, a pretty healthy Bengals team. I think this is where we can see that end there. And then also too, I think it's worth noting that like Mariota wasn't under pressure nearly at all in his, uh, in that game against the 49ers, a team that usually can get to the quarterback. The Bengals aren't on that same caliber when it comes to pass rushing the quarterback, but they're definitely better than average. And when Mariota has been under pressure, I mean, he's been abysmal. I don't, I don't think he's completing more than 40% of his uh, pass attempts in that scenario. He has like an adjusted completion percentage of just over 50%. If they can get pressure on Mariota in this game, I think that could also be a big difference for them this week as well. Yeah, just force them to drop back, right? Don't let them get in a, right. a game script where they're allowed to just kind of dictate pace and tempo and, and run the ball all over the place. So, yeah, I think that the caliber of offense that the Bengals have is going to push them to a spot they, they didn't get to last week. No doubt. All right, let's talk about another game that you and I are both interested in here. This is actually one of my favorite plays on the week right now is the Titans getting two and a half points against the Colts. This is going to be the second time that these two teams have met already um, this season here. Jonathan Taylor did practice fully on Wednesday, so obviously the expectation, uh, barring any uh, setbacks during the week, is that he will play against this game. But we can't remember that Taylor had one of his worst games of the year against this Titans club, only 42 yards on 20 carries uh, earlier this season. Really the biggest weakness for the Titans has been their secondary and allowing quarterbacks to just go downfield against them. You know, I get we're going to remember that Matt Ryan had that great game last week and, oh, he's back. Everything's great with with Matt Ryan here. I'm I'm ready to back him again. But um, I just think that this is such an odd number for the Titans who really after the first two weeks of the season when they looked abysmal, has been playing so much better football since then, but it feels like maybe the public hasn't caught on to this or we just still have this entrenched in our minds that there's this horrible team playing in a bad uh, division. But when I look at this, I'm like, only two and a half points against the Colts? Like, what if the Colts showed me that this spread should only be two and a half? So I look at this and I'm like, I have to be all over the Titans, right? Yeah, rest advantage too, right? They're coming off of their bye. And yep. that's, uh, you know, those little added things, they, they do help as the season goes along. You know, the Titans are so hard to handicap, I feel like. They are magic beans. Like, they just these things that we sure, really don't sure. measure and, and can't measure, they seem to just kind of put together. Vrabel gets these guys to, you know, outperform. And whether it's game plan specific, you know, that same matchup we talked about, we just saw these teams go head-to-head a couple of weeks ago. And you know, the Colts came in and, you know, they were struggling offensively, but they had been limiting – even without Shaq Leonard, anything on the ground. And yep. like, I think D, D Hendo, Hendo gets over his prop in like the first half and just runs all over them. We'll probably be out without Shaq Leonard, Leonard again here. I just worry about the upside offensively for the Titans. I think under sure. here is probably a, a decent look uh, again without, you know, they didn't have a lot of upside offensively coming into the season. Now you're really looking at like, you know, Robert Woods is your, your main alpha receiver here. They're at some point going to have to move the football through the air. Um, I just worry about the Colts too, being able to protect like last week, they dropped Matt right. Ryan back a million times, but it was just a little dump offs. And I'd love to see like Naheem Hines or Jonathan Taylor used that way. Occasionally, like we, we were right. like, fighting for three targets for Jonathan Taylor and you decide you need to like pepper Dion Jackson with targets. But uh, I'm almost pot committed to this game through the futures market. And I don't know how to approach it this week. I think it's a great match. Sure. I think it's important. But I took I took the Titans to not make the playoffs, and I took the Colts to win the division. Uh. So I feel like I'm kind of already on the Colts, and I just yeah, kind of yeah. need to ride that out. I don't know if I should hedge. Um, you know, I think you make some sense in having the Titans be uh, probably the right side here, being under three. Uh, but I don't know if hedging is the right. I'm just not a hedge guy, Steve. I don't know about you. Like I'm with you. I like to, I'm kinda, with you. <laughs> I like to ride out my convictions, yes. take lock, and uh, yeah, just, I feel like I'm on the right side here. And maybe if I don't get it, it'll come out later in the year. But I understand leaning Titans here. But I think under is probably the, the, the good look here. You can get something still around like 42 and a half. Probably a good look. Uh, you know, the, the, the few times that I've hedged out future bets, they've never worked out for me. So I'm just, I feel like I'm just scorned when I, when I do this. Although I will say, 
I am trying to find a way to hedge out on the Jets because I did have them at under <laughs> six wins, and they're already halfway there, and we're only into week seven. So that is I'm not I'm not too happy about that because I felt very strong about that before the season began, and I got the six right as the Wilson injury happened because then it ended up dropping to to five and a half. So I'm like, great, I got six, I got it at even money. I'm happy about this. Like I I feel good. And then Flacco wins two games that he probably shouldn't have won. And now here we are, right? And now they actually look pretty decent. So I'm like, you know, I'm basically begging for a push, but I don't even think I'm going to get that <laughs> when it comes to this. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on, on hedging out. I, I'm totally with you there. Um, do you think that this is a, an interesting game for props too? Because um, we have two secondaries that have been pretty poor here. Alec Pierce yeah. has really come to life in, in this Colts offense. We're see, seeing more and more on the snap counts there. You know, Michael Pittman Jr. is still by far the, the, the wide receiver one here, but – Pierce is really getting into that wide receiver two range. Um, I think this is a good spot where I want to target the player props on both Pittman and Pierce. I don't think they're out yet on DraftKings Sportsbook, but is this going to be a player prop heavy game for you? Because I think it is going to be for me too. Yeah, a few looks there, and you mentioned them too. Shockingly, India's first in explosive pass rate on the season. Yeah, We wouldn't think that necessarily. No, uh, not at all. (laughs) Where they're at, and uh, the Titans are 31st in defensive DVOA against wide receiver ones. 32nd against wide receiver twos. So wow. we do know that there's a fairly narrow target tree with Indy, right? That kind of mix in all three of the tight ends, but it's really just Pittman. And now like Pierce has really emerged as that next guy. Uh, so I think they're both good looks. And then to mention too, like Robert Woods has kind of started to improve from a route participation standpoint. He is up in three straight weeks. It was 72% to 76%, all the way up to 84%. Yeah, uh, before the bye against uh, Washington. So, you know, the way that Woods kind of works, he'd probably be like a receptions look for me versus yardage. Yep. I don't expect him to do anything really electric after he catches it. But I think Pittman and, and Pierce are both guys that maybe you could look at their yards over or uh, even Pierce with the way they're using him deep down the field is like longest reception over. I think are probably yep. good looks. And then obviously, you know, this is kind of more of a general question just because we don't have numbers out yet. But what do you think yeah. about unders for both Henry and Taylor in this one? Taylor coming off the ankle injury, uh, Henry going up a pretty good Colts run defense. You know, obviously Henry is one of those guys that can break it against no matter what. But at least from what we yeah. saw, not a strong matchup for either side. Any any just kind of general thoughts on that? No, Henry is like, that is the most painful under to take ever. Well, of course. Um, and it was weird. Like he's always in like the 90s. And then when they matched up a couple of weeks ago, um, I believe DraftKings posted him at like 74 and a half, uh, which is yep. just unusual. Like I said, even in a bad matchup, he crushed it in the first half. So, um, yeah, that's just like a, a, a hold your breath, uh, play the numbers. I think Nick Chubb in, you know, in uh, Browns yep. Ravens is kind of in the same boat this week. It's probably the right side. Uh, it's probably under or nothing for me, but I just don't know that I have the stomach for, for having under tickets on some of those guys that can break those big ones at just a higher rate than everyone else can. So that's kind of where DN Henry falls for me. All right, I want to get to one more game in the 1 o'clock window here. Uh, Giants-Jaguars going in this one. Uh, Giants are underdogs, three-point underdogs to the Jags in this one here. I remember when uh, you know we were kind of getting the lines for this week, a lot of surprise that the Giants were underdogs despite playing as well as they have been. Uh, are, are you on this spot that the Giants are, are as good as we're seeing, or are you kind of looking for some gre- regression to come at some point against, to be fair, a, a Jaguars team that has been better defensively than I think people are getting them credit for, but the – scoring has really kind of been where this team has been sputtering. Yeah. I feel like this is kind of like uh, how our, and I'm not going to go into a, uh, you know, off the rails thought here, but I think this is how our society is nowadays. We can't walk and chew gum at the same time. We just can't do two. We can't do two things at once. Yeah, uh, The giants can be both well coached and yeah. outperforming their talent and yeah. like stealing some wins that they probably shouldn't have. And not as good as your prototypical five and one team. Like <laughs> sure. these yeah. are like we can do two things at once, people. These both yeah. things are happening concurrently, <laughs> and it's just okay. It's okay. Um, so we want to give him credit for coaching, right? Brian Dayball, yeah. everyone was kind of bullish on that. Mike yeah. Kafka has had ties to you know both the Chiefs and with Dayball and you know with uh, Josh Allen. So like they've they're coming here and they're taking advantage. We know the things that we've had some success at times with Wink Martindale and his you know, blitz heavy defense and it's working. And I think it's going to maybe work again here because Trevor Lawrence has been atrocious in his short time as an NFL starter against blitz pressure, especially when the blitz is 
backed up with man behind them. We've seen more and more teams this year because I think the the rise of the cover two stuff, more and more teams are playing zone behind their blitz stuff. Not the Giants. The Giants will go cover zero. They'll take you man sure. across the field and they'll bring the house. And that's not really worked at all. And we have a pretty sizable trend at this point for, for Trevor Lawrence. It's not worked for him. So I feel like it's the fishy side. I feel like Jacksonville's a team that I've wanted to be a little bit long on in the season. I just don't think this is the right spot. So I'm interested to see if this moves at all. Um, yeah. See if there's any, you know, what kind of action it gets here in the next 48 hours here to see if this gets up to three and a half. Cause I do think there's some public sentiment on, yeah, the giants feels fishy and like the books know something we don't know. And maybe this kind of climbs because yeah. this is giants plus three and a half. It's probably going to be a play for me. So otherwise this is a stay yeah. away. It's a giants or nothing. Um, even though I still think they're going to be six and one, they could be six and one next week. And they're still yep. not a very good football team. Um, no, it's incredible. But at the end of the day, and then they play the Seahawks next week, Steve. I so, know. Like, they can I know. do it again. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, it's okay to kind of uh, do both of these things at the same time. They're, they're well coached. They're executing. I think Wandell Robinson helps them a little bit, um, you know, to kind of solidify something there. They obviously drafted him above where everyone thought. So they're going to they're gonna scheme some stuff up for that guy. He can do some stuff after he catches the ball. I don't know. I think that they're going to be better than what they've done offensively with the likes of, you know, David Sills and, and Richie James. So yeah, I kind of like the giants if they can get to three and a half. Yeah. Just real quickly too. I think three, if they do get to three and a half, I think that might, might end up being one of my more favorite teaser lakes getting out to nine and a half. If that does yeah. uh, get to that point. Uh, just real quickly. want to just hit on some, a uh, couple four o'clock games here. We mentioned the Seahawks here. They're going up against the Chargers. You want to talk about look ahead lines. Uh, Chargers are seven and a half about a week ago. This has come down to five on DraftKings Sportsbook. Absolutely hate that number here at five. I mean, I really don't want to back either side at this rate, but um, it's kind of hard to not at least look at the Seahawks at this point here just because of how good they are on early downs. Uh, that's been something that the Chargers have struggled with is defense on, on early downs here. Any, any thoughts on this one here? Because I would love to get some involvement in this game, but like I keep going back and forth, especially at this number. It's, it's tough at five. Yeah, the sevens that were out there on the Monday, I think, are uh, are great looks. But yeah, now down to five is a little bit dicey for me. But I understand the movement, right? Like the Chargers, sure. this is what their MO was last year. They go out and they you know, make lots of splashes in free agency, sign Sebastian Joseph Day to kind of like anchor the middle so you just can't run all over them. And here we are, six weeks in, they're 28th in EPA per rush allowed. We're just seeing them gashed by Latavius Murray, of all people, last week. So... <laughs> Um, and I, I don't know, like Ken Walker looked spry and like exciting yeah. last week, 21 yeah, of the 23 running back carries. It's like, I, I don't know, like I can, I can understand where we're at. JC Jackson, right. Big splash free agent acquisition is just getting torched. And now you have multiple options here where we're kind of seeing both DK and Tyler Lockett kind of emerge with Geno Smith here. So yeah, the Seahawks are also, even though it's kind of moving, also probably another decent teaser like here to kind of tease up um, if it continues sure. to move through. We're obviously not getting the, the perfect long teasers to work through key numbers or anything here at this point. But yeah, to get it past the seven, I think it's probably a good look too. Because yeah, it's, I don't know at what point it's there's Chargers buyback, but I would think it will probably be around now and it doesn't seem to be happening. Right. So I'm interested to see what the movement is here in the next 48 hours here too. And then we talked about a little bit earlier, the, the 49ers dealing with a brash number of injuries here. Now they have the unfortunate task of trying to contain the Chiefs team, not just Chiefs at all, a Chiefs coming off the loss here. Uh, I was actually kind of surprised this, this hasn't happened often uh, often lately, but the Chiefs against the spread coming off a loss over the past three years, uh, excuse me, two years, are only four and four against the spread. Uh, this kind of felt like a spot where, the, you know, when they come back, they come out, you know, guns a blazing or whatever. But to me, it's... How do you feel about this line here? Because at least from what we saw last week coming into this one, does it kind of feel like we're being undersold on the Chiefs a little bit because they're coming off the loss here? Because in all things, if all things were even here, the Chiefs win that game. I can't imagine this is still sitting at two and a half. Yeah. And then there was a little buyback, right? Where we got from, it was one and a half and look aheads. We got up to three and then it bounced back down a little bit. So I think we're kind of probably at fair market value at this point. I still think the chiefs are probably the side. Um, I just don't think that the Niners are going to have, because even though they're going to get some guys back here, I think they'll get most guys yeah. back for next week's Rams game. Um, I just don't think that they're going to have enough to really offensively compete here. And you have to turn sure. the ball over 
to Jimmy G and allow him to kind of push the ball aggressively. It's just not something that they want to do or that they've thrived in doing with Jimmy, you know, under center. So I still think the Chiefs are going to push them to a spot that they don't want to go to. And there'll be enough injuries still, especially in the secondary, where I think Patrick Mahomes led team, you know, coming off of a, a loss like that is going to want to get them right. So yeah, if it's still hanging at two and a half, I still think the Chiefs at the side. Uh, real quick, before we give our best bet here, you just mentioned you were doing the look ahead lines for week eight here. Is there any spot in particular you think that betters can maybe take advantage of while everybody's kind of focused here on week seven? That line actually is. So I think we're going back to the well with the NFC West team, the uh, Niners and Rams again. Uh, that is Rams minus two and a half. Uh, I don't wow. really understand why. They, yeah. just, just, they, know, they have their number. We know that the Niners have their number. Um, the note boom injury again. At this point, we might get like Bosa back for this Chiefs game, but if not, he's definitely going to be back for that game. Same thing with like Williams up front. Like they're just getting healthier. I just have a lot of questions go with what's going on with the Rams. So I think, you know, taking the two and a half makes a lot of sense. Um, that's probably the best bet. All right. So we're going to give our best bets here for week seven. Of course, we're going to let you go first, Ryan. Uh, anything on the board here? You can go any route, player, prop, side, total, whatever you want to do. What's your best bet here for week seven? Uh, I'm in on the Ravens team total over 26 and a half against the Browns. We have a, uh, a 26 and a half matters a lot when you think of how the distribution of scores go for team totals. You know, we're kind of once you get through 24, 25, 26 are kind of dead numbers. So we want to make sure that we're getting on the right side. So I think this is a play at 26 and a half, not so much at 27 and a half, but um, Lamar's really dominated the Browns. Uh, he got injured in the early November match of last year and then missed the December rematch. The Ravens have scored 20, I'm sorry, 47, 38, 31, and 25 in Lamar starts against the Browns. Wow. Um, and he's done it against them with his legs. He's top 58 on the ground in five of six starts, three of those games. He went for over 90 yards. And this Browns defense is just hemorrhaging yards on the ground. They are dead last in rush EPA. They've given up the third most points per game on the season. I just think this is kind of a get right spot. I think they are no answer for Andrews. We probably see Rashad Bateman back here. So Ravens over 26 and a half is my best bet of the week. I'm going to go with Titans minus two and a half here against the Colts. Also don't mind a play here, uh, taking the Titans spread on the first half. It's minus one, two as well. Colts, mm -hmm. Colts are 0 for six against the spread this season. Uh, failing to cover by an average of almost nine points this season too as well. So you can even maybe do a little bit of a double dip in there too as well. But I think this is going to be a good spot for the Titans to cover that spread there against the Colts. So that's my bet here for this week. Uh, as always, Ryan, my dude, thank you so much for coming on here. Betting content manager at 444 and at 444 Bets. Check out all of his content. He said there was free content there too as well at 444, but truly 444.com. A fantastic spot for all your football needs, both daily fantasy, sports betting, and season long. So check that out. Newton, I hope you have it on here again, dude. Thanks again so much for coming on. Anytime, Steve. Appreciate you, buddy. All right, but that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Unreasonable Wilds podcast. I'll be back solo. Julian is doing whatever he is, getting thrown up on or something, I'm sure. We'll talk to Johnny Velo on Tuesday. And then I think we have Dave Sherapan coming on with us on Thursday. We'll talk to you guys then. Odds and lines are subject to change. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. 